Boom. Uh, and we are live. Welcome, everybody. Nice to see Natalie, Ashley, Philip is here, Alf Alfonso. That's cool. And Angela and other friends. All right. So, can you see me? Can you hear me? Send me a quick message on the chat. This is actually live. Uh, all right. Perfect. Uh, Okie dokie. Uh, beautiful. So, we're going to talk about paid acquisition, paid campaigns. Uh, there's a presentation component to our uh, time today. There's a discussion component for the discussion, like questions you have about optimizing your paid campaigns. Please use the questions tab, not the chat, because your question might drown um, in the noise. Uh, does everybody here run paid campaigns? When I talk to people about paid campaigns, what I'm hearing is that the competition in the demand acquisition channels is getting more intense. Costs are going up. Are you, you guys seeing that? Or is somebody saying that, ooh, the PPC is just cheaper by the day? <laughs> what are you seeing, guys? Uh, let me know in the chat. Who feels that it's getting more expensive, more competitive? Um, never goes down. Ken, don't <laughs> say it ain't so. Um, and so in this uh, today's uh, workshop, um, the, the actual knowledge is delivered by Susan Winograd, who's an 20 years mm -hmm. of PPC experience or something. God, I hate hearing that in some ways. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> you old. must be old. <laughs> I am. I am. You and me both. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but also, you know, with, with great age comes great wisdom because they've seen stuff before. Um, yep. Yeah. And so without further ado, Susan, uh, why don't you tell us about what's happening and how can we improve things? And I'll see you in about 30 minutes for, for a Q&A session. Sounds perfect. Hey, everybody. Um, here to talk about one of my favorite things and something I've done for a lot of years and um, something that I feel like e-commerce and D2C is very prolific in and um, that would be paid media and a lot of struggle on the B2B side. So um, I'm going to take you through kind of what I do with my clients, um, my recommendations for optimizing how you handle paid media, because, you know, I think the expectations around it have kind of been outdated and they need to change a little bit. So let's dive in. Um, so something that I find interesting is I will meet with companies and say, how do people typically hear about you and how long does it take to close a deal or close a demo or, you know, whatever their initial goal is. And the companies know, and they will tell me, and nine times out of 10, it is not that users find solutions uh, for these problems via paid search. And it's usually a longer action time to get a demo versus, um, you know, or, or acquire a client. So there is this awareness that users finding solutions takes time, and it also takes a while to get them to convert. But my first rule that I always tell companies is you have to stop measuring platform success on immediate demos or bookings or sales. And it's kind of funny because like I said, I'll ask those two questions. They know the answer is that it takes a while for these things to happen. They know that um, the, the platforms might not be really well geared to that. But then when we switch to specifically talking about paid media, I start to hear some things that completely conflict with that knowledge. Things like, Google ads doesn't have enough search volume for what we do, or Google ads brings in free registrations, but not buyers, or we never get book demos from it. Then they'll start talking about LinkedIn and we'll hear LinkedIn is too expensive. We tried lead gen and it didn't work. Again, we never get book demos from it. And then we go to Facebook and it's, we can't target our audience on Facebook. We never get book demos from it. So what's interesting for me is whether it's, you know, book demos or customers, for some reason, I consistently see misalignment of expectations. So in the beginning, they'll say, yes, you know, we the demos take time to book. We um, sometimes have a hard time, um, you know, reaching out directly to our audience. It's a lot of word of mouth. But then as soon as they start spending money on paid media, they expect all of that to go away <laughs> for the magic money machine to book demos for them. And obviously, it doesn't work that way. So I'm going to take you through step by step the framework they use with 
brands and clients to get them to understand how to look at their paid media and how to judge its success. So the first thing is evaluate how your audience actually does things first. And like I said, there is an awareness of this typically where, you know, people say it's a lot of word of mouth, um, you know, there's RFP processes, or a lot of times they're in contracts, so they can't get out of them yet. So it, you know, they'll get word of mouth, but it might take them a while to switch. So keep all those things in mind. And when you then pivot and look at your paid media, there's a couple of things that I see companies run into over and over and over. So the first thing to understand is, does your product solve a problem for most everyone that has this issue or wants to be able to do this thing? Or is it for a select audience? So here are some examples. Let's say you have email marketing software, but it's specialized for e-commerce companies, right? Or you have SEO software, but it's only for enterprise level or you do media reporting software, but it's really the most useful for agencies. So you're kind of a market within a market, right? So there's people looking in these examples for these software types, but you really specialize in helping a particular segment of them. This is very typical. And this is something that I think a lot of places forget because these select audiences within these larger groups when it comes to something like, for example, paid search, they don't search differently than the customers you don't want, right? So if someone's searching for email marketing software, they don't necessarily put in for enterprise companies or for e-com companies. So you don't know the person or the situation that's actually performing these actions. And that's an issue when it comes to paid, because obviously our ability to be able to narrow down to those personas is a little more limited, especially now with privacy. So when you look at things like search or any of these other platforms, it's important to ask yourself a couple things. First, is it a problem that people actually seek to solve? So are they aware that there are solutions and they just need a recommendation? If so, how do they typically do that? Is it that you normally see them post on LinkedIn saying, hey, I'm looking to switch providers for X, who do you guys use? Or a lot of times on Twitter, anecdotally, you'll see people say, hey, um, what is everyone using for blah, blah, blah? So a lot of times there's crowdsourcing that happens with this um, because anytime you take on a new, you know, B2B platform or SaaS, there's a learning curve. It's a commitment, right? Like you have to learn a whole new thing. So a lot of people do not even want to start going down that road unless there's some, you know, some social confirmation. So with something like this, if you know that they aren't even aware a solution exists and they're not searching for anything, that right away should be telling you that things like paid search may not be a great solution, but I still see companies put money there and be frustrated when it doesn't do anything. So start with these questions first and be very realistic with yourself about how people seek to either switch providers, solve solutions, et cetera. That's the first rule. The second rule is optimize your media towards getting your target users, your ideal users off of those platforms and onto your list. As you all mentioned in the beginning, yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's way more competitive. So the last thing you want to do is just keep dumping money in, trying to get people to do a bottom of the funnel action. If you go back to the beginning where I said most companies recognize, hey, it takes like months for people to end up booking a demo or weeks, that doesn't go away just because you're paying for media. So when you're looking at your you know, paid media mix, what you're really looking to do is build a captive audience because you are going to be limited by what you're able to do on the platforms. Ideally, you want to use those platforms to find the right users, get them the heck off there, have them opt into things where you can control what you're sending them, educating them, how you're messaging things. And if you do all of those things right, the demos are going to show up. No one likes to hear this because they're like, I just want to put money into media and have demos show up. And I get it. But the platforms are generally, as a rule, not very good at that. Um, because it does take education. Like I said, these are commitments. These aren't people that are like, oh, great, a B2B software that I'm now going to have to add into my rotation of things we do. I'll just go ahead and sign up today. Very rarely happens. So you have to look at this with an eye of, you know, not necessarily how do I get these things to book demos for us tomorrow, but how do I find the users that are going to become demos in the weeks and months that are to come? So then, of course, the natural question is, okay, but how do we do that? So I've broken down the main platforms that people use for their strengths and what they're not so good at. And I have some cheat sheets for each. Now, granted, this does not always apply. There are unicorn instances. I'm putting all of the usual disclaimers in here. 
But if you pull back from a 30,000 foot level, this is typically what you're going to encounter with these platforms. So the first is Google ads. Um, I see a lot of over-reliance on paid search. I'm not sure exactly where that comes from. I think it's because the perception is people that are searching are in buy mode and they are either in comparison shopping mode or they're further down the funnel. Um, that's not gonna be true typically for B2B SaaS. They, are, they might be in research mode, um, but that just because it's a, a lower funnel reach doesn't mean that they're going to convert right away. So what Google ads tends to be good for with B2B, especially with SaaS is reaching solution seekers in broad markets. So like I mentioned before, different customer types don't search differently a lot of times. So that's not like they're going to raise their hand and say, Hey, I want this thing, but I really only want it for these instances. They don't get that specific. So when you do this, just know that you're going to be probably reaching people that are not your ICP or ideal customer profile. You'll see me refer to that a lot in here. Um, you might find later that they are, but you're not really going to know. And search can be kind of an expensive endeavor to figure that out. Um, it can do well for things like driving low commitment conversion types. So free trials, um, you know, opt-ins to things if they get to your site and like what they see. Um, it can drive demos. Like I said, I've seen it, but it usually winds up not being the ICP. There usually went, ends up being like a lot of waste. For example, if you you know have enterprise level stuff, you're going to get a lot of SMBs because they don't have the network that enterprise users do to just ask what they should be using. So you're going to find a lot of times the searchers are people that you know, they're not larger companies or this is a, an SMB with a one-off need they need to fill and they don't necessarily spend time on platforms like LinkedIn or Twitter asking for recommendations. What Google Ads is not good at, and I've mentioned some of this, is, you know, reaching solutions seekers in niche cases or, you know, niche industries, um, reaching ICP for higher dollar offerings, again, when there are so many SMB type competitors. So I see this a lot in SaaS where it's, you know, one will typically tailor its services or offerings towards SMB. There's another that's enterprise. And the enterprise will be like, well, I see, you know, such and such spending all this money on paid search. And it's like, yes, but they're going after SMBs that aren't asking for advice. They don't really grasp the whole dark social thing. So you're not really competing for the same person. Um, and then, of course, driving high commitment conversions like they search for something, they come to the site and all of a sudden they subscribe um, doesn't usually happen. Uh, let's move on to LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is good at several things. Um, obviously, you can reach target company sizes, types, and job roles. So this is kind of where its strength is, is where Google is not as good, right? So this is more of a persona-based play. Um, we do typically see that you'll get good opt-ins. Um, sometimes you will get some demos. Um, you know, of course, just like anything else with an opt-in, the show rate and if they show up for their demos, if they show up for the webinars and the things they sign up for needs to be watched. Um, but if you're going after specific job roles or specific company sizes, this can help. Um, it's not so good at driving high volume because, you know, your, your product may not have a high volume of users. It may be very specific users. So sometimes this isn't necessarily a shortcoming of LinkedIn. It's just the reality of how large your market is. And then, um, LinkedIn is infamous for not being cheap. <laughs> so it is not a low cost, a low cost platform. Um, there, you kind of have to look at this relatively speaking though. So people get sticker shock a lot from LinkedIn by the cost of the clicks, the CPMs, et cetera. But I'm going to take you through how you should be using metrics to compare these things to one another. So, um, we'll, we'll kind of discuss, you know, expensive, relatively speaking, when you're doing paid media for B2B. And then finally, you know, Meta, I'm sorry, it's Facebook, but whatever. Um, <laughs> what it is good at is obviously you can reach users at scale. So despite any of the, um, you know, the, the blowback that it continues to get, it is still a massive audience on there. It still does drive results and you can get some very good lower commitment opt-ins for a really decent price. What it's not good at is kind of a hybrid. It's, it's an interesting hybrid actually of LinkedIn and Google because you can't get down to like a niche audience like you can on LinkedIn, where you can say, I want this company size. Um, you can try things like job titles, but they're self input on Facebook. And a lot of people don't use it for work, so they don't update it. Um, so it's it's a little scattershot with that. Um, and again, it's not great at high commitment things like an hour long webinar sign up or a demo. Um, so, you know, the the cost is kind of relative to the value that you get. 
So when we're looking at these platforms, there's kind of two parts to this. So my, my third rule is you need to be answering the right questions. So let's look at what this means. When you look at top funnel, mid funnel and bottom funnel, which, you know, we know that the user journey is a lot more complicated than that, but I'm just trying to keep it simple for the purposes of illustration. Top funnel, you're looking to answer the question, what works cost efficiently to get quality users opted into our content? That is the main goal of top funnel. It is not to get demos. And I see every, almost, I won't say every, but I would say probably honestly 98 to 99% of the companies I work with that's not at all how they measure it. They run a bunch of money. They don't get demos or subscriptions for it and they turn it off. It's never going to show you that. So when you're looking at, you know, early level optimization versus later level where it's like, yes, you do eventually want these to turn into demos and you will see in time if that's happening, but you can't predict that. The best you're going to be able to do is say, who are we getting onto our list? Um, are these the people we want? So that should be your guiding principle on everything for that top of funnel spend. For mid funnel, um, if they're, let's say they're already opted in, they're already familiar with their brand, what is working for engagement and bottom funnel migration? So if we have remarketing running and we're promoting content, what are they interested in? What are they clicking on? What's driving efficiency for us? Is there anything that they are clicking on or we are serving them that is moving them to bottle funnel, bottom of funnel. Well, they, they are requesting a demo. So you want them to just make that next step. Bottom funnel, obviously, what is getting these demos booked? And that really starts to fall more to how you're handling sales. Um, what closes the deals? What gets the demos booked? And then, of course, you're eventually going to start tying this back to how did we find these users in the first place? And I don't see enough of that happen as far as, hey, if these people booked in to get a demo from us, have they been on our list? How long have they been on our list? Where did they come from? You need to do that closed loop to make sure that you continue investing in the things that are eventually driving the people that are likely to become demos or subscribers for you. So these things might sound kind of fuzzy, but they do have metrics that should be measured. So let's talk specifically, um, you know, brass tacks about what to look at with the costs of each of these steps. So on top of funnel, because we want to answer the question, how many quality people are we getting onto our list? We are going to look at the cost and the quality of the engagement. So if we're doing things like just trying to get some initial brand awareness, try and build credibility, what is the CPC costing depending on the, um, the platform we're doing? And then I always look at kind of like time on site or how engaged they were, because if you get a bunch of people for a $10 CPC and they bounce after three seconds, who cares? So you want to make sure that you're balancing what you're paying to get them to the site with what they're actually doing there. Are they actually absorbing what you're giving um, from a, a value perspective? And then if you're running things to acquire email addresses or opt-ins, what's it costing you to do that? We're going to break this down a little further in a minute, but these are the two things that I would recommend looking at from top funnel. Do not complicate it any further than that. You know, if you, if you see that you're getting demos booked off of it, hooray for you, it's not usual. So just see what it's costing. Um, but by and large with top funnel efforts, this is the stuff you're going to look at. Mid funnel, um, you're going to be looking at engagement costs. So if you're kind of running like video commercial type stuff, what's it costing you on a CPM basis? How long are people watching? Again, TOS is time on site. What's your CPC? So basically just how engaged are these people with what we're creating? And this is a really good signal for you for your content as well. Um, it's going to let you know, are we creating things that are speaking to our audience? Are we providing value that they're finding helpful? Um, so keep those things in mind because some of your costs may not mean it's a platform problem. It could be what you're producing for these people as well. And then, of course, this is non-paid, but once they're mid-funnel, if they're in your list, what does your engagement look like? What are your email health metrics? What is your show up rate for, you know, demos or webinars or anything else that comes from that? And then, of course, bottom funnel is how many demos did you book? Um, how many people showed up? And then how many deals were closed? So this is something I actually made for um, a client because they've they've been very focused on sort of last click bottom funnel. Um, so this is sort of the cheat sheet of if you're looking at things like content, non-SEO stuff that you might create like guides, downloads, white papers. What are the metrics for that? If you're doing SEO, what does the metrics look like for that? Email list growth and health. And then finally paid media. Because the reality is 
all four of those things are going to drive that top level brand growth proof of everything that you want uh, in the form of demos, paid customers, et cetera. But each of these pillars has their own little levers within them that you need to be pressure testing, getting rid of, coming up with new ways of doing. Um, all those things are what's going to drive your brand growth. So I just pause here to mention that because again, paid media will do some heavy lifting for you, but you cannot neglect these other areas and think that paid media is going to make up for it for you. Um, it cannot do all of that. It never will. So just try and keep in mind where in the process it tends to lend the most value. Fourth rule is analyze and test the right things in the top of funnel to drive quality downstream. The last thing you want to do is get a bazillion signups and, you know, four months later, none of them have turned into anything, for example. So optimizing for quality is another area where I see a lot of companies um, kind of not really put anything in place for this. The easiest way to do this is every opt-in form, no matter where you run it, this is true on your site, this is true on paid, have a single qualification question that is easy for someone to answer. Uh, typically, a yes, no is going to be great. So if you know that you know your product does best for places with $10 million in revenue, or it works best if they have 500 employees or more, or whatever that thing is that is the initial hurdle that tells you, are they an ICP or are they not, put it on every form. This is going to help you immensely understand who are you reaching in these platforms? Are the, they the people you want? Um, and then you're also going to want to make sure when you have that question, if they opt in, have welcome drips that go out and watch the engagement. Because again, if you end up opting in hundreds of your ICP based on that qualifying question, but then none of them open the emails, they all are completely unengaged or heaven forbid they unsubscribe you're not doing yourself any favors. So you have to make sure that that initial onboarding is the right person and that you are creating value right away so that they don't leave. So optimize always for quality. And again, have it on every opt-in form, no matter where you run. It's gonna help you understand, hey, yes, LinkedIn does typically reach you know, the people that we want or Facebook reach the people we want 20% of the time. So here's what that looks like from a math perspective. So, as far as testing and how you measure it, there's a couple ways you can look at this. Um, if you want to test the creative messaging, usually what I will recommend in that case is measure the percentage of ICP versus non-ICP that opt in. It's always very interesting to me. Um, typically, you'll find that there are certain creative messages that attract or repel who you want. So as you start to figure out what are the things that we put in our ads, that attract that right ICP, we need to keep doing more of that. So you're going to want to watch that. That is really going to be kind of the harbinger of what you focus on in your creative moving forward. Um, the form questions or landing page experience, um, how you, you know, introduce the product, how you entice them to sign up. You're going to want to measure that by looking at your cost per opt-in of your ideal customer. This is why I say make sure you have that qualifying question because all of your costs need to come back to that. It doesn't help you to have a $5 opt-in if 1% of them are the people you actually want. So make sure you're keeping an eye on that. And then test all kinds of different content. You're going to find sort of the same thing where the CPC on engagement and site interest is probably going to fluctuate. Um, and there may be things that bring them in, um, but they opt in for, you know, something that isn't necessarily totally related to what they came on the site for. So just watch what you promote, how it performs on the platforms, and then what users do once they get there. If we draw it back to the platform question, um, with Google ads, I would say, you know, expect to have low opt-ins if it's not a content play. So if you are a very content heavy site and you answer a lot of questions that are helpful, you may see higher opt-ins because people are like, this is great. I need to get, I just want to get this information delivered to me ongoing. Um, but typically that's not what happens. They usually come kind of get their question answered and leave. So just expect you're probably going to have low opt-ins. Um, again, you'll probably have possibly very limited traffic if it's not something people search for. Limited control over ICP targeting. Um, and then the other thing that I, is just very neglected with this is that brand awareness does play a part in your success with Google ads. Um, you know, there seems to be this perception of paid search that if someone's searching for stuff, all ads are equal and just whoever ranks first is going to win. That is not the case. If they see four ads and they haven't heard of three of those, you know, companies, but they've heard of one, guess who they're going to go with. So this is why I say you cannot neglect all those other areas and think it's going to make up for it. 
Facebook, this is where we start talking about that Facebook versus LinkedIn relative expense that I mentioned earlier. So with Facebook ads, you're probably going to get cheap opt-ins. Um, that was always, you know, it's always kind of been a really good source of newsletter opt-ins for B2B. But there's a chunk of it that's going to be a waste, meaning that it's not your ICP. This is why having that qualifying question is super important because Facebook ads could lure you in by thinking that this is really cheap. But then when you actually back out your cost per ICP, you may find it is actually the same as what it costs you on LinkedIn. So in that case, scale is usually almost always Facebook's advantage. Um, but you just need to be careful that you're measuring the right things again. Um, as far as targeting goes, like I mentioned, um, you can't measure, I mean, you can't uh, target job titles or anything that specific. So I usually recommend target aligned software interests. Um, if there's associations, uh, events, industry publications, anything that indicates that these are people that are in this industry, um, you can't guarantee they're a decision maker or anything, but it'll at least help you get closer. And then um, LinkedIn ads, like I mentioned, it looks expensive relative to other channels. Um, but the B2B targeting is exquisite <laughs> um, with job levels, titles, industry verticals, company sizes and revenue. Um, I This is why I recommend, you know, give it a shot and compare apples to apples when it comes to Facebook. If you run the same thing on both, um, you're probably going to find your proportion of ICP on LinkedIn is very, very high. Um, and so it'll look more expensive, but if, you know, by the time you actually measure that for Facebook ads, they may not be as far apart as you think. So it can be tough because on LinkedIn, because it's more expensive, the testing is much more high stakes. Um, you know, it takes a little bit longer to learn because there's not as much scale, et cetera. But I would really recommend that you try and do those two things, those two platforms head to head measuring that, that difference. And so then the inevitable question is, okay, great. So I know what to measure. I kind of have an idea of where we should be running. My expectations are aligned, but what on earth do we actually say in our ads? So let's just talk briefly about creative because this varies widely depending on what you're trying to do. But I can tell you, B2B, this is the reputation for B2B ads. Please do not do this. It's awful. It's boring. No one cares. <laughs> so... The difference is B2B is boring, but humans in B2B are not. So here was a great example I pulled off of Cognizum where there's, I mean, it's super casual. It's obviously a sales guy in his cap. It's live cold calls. This was a video ad. So like, who doesn't want to listen to a cold call and hear how it goes, right? It's, it's great. So, I mean, if you look at the opening line, what do F1 cars and eager sales reps have in common? This doesn't look B2B, right? Because it's humans. This, you know, being a human in a B2B world is a superpower still. <laughs> like I said, most of the ads we see are those really awful ones that I showed you that just don't mean anything and they just kind of run to run them. Um, so that's not to say that you have to have something that looks this casual, but you really need to remember that you are selling to humans and that you are a company made of humans. So the more you can connect on that level, the better you're going to see your stuff perform. Um, one of the things that I've had work really well in the past is um, what are things that you know about their world where like the you'd be in on the joke, for example. So if you look at the ad on the right, this was something we ran from our pipe where this was a meme that we came up with. This was by far. I mean, it wasn't even close. Our best performer for newsletter opt ins. And those people were highly engaged and they stayed. We had hundreds of comments on this ad, all from people tagging their friends, their coworkers, um, anything that kind of shows you that you get them. The other benefit to it is that if they don't get that joke, they're not your right person anyway. So don't try and appeal, appeal to everybody, appeal to the users you want and show that you understand their pain. And of course, humor always helps, but some sometimes it's hard to find humor, <laughs> in some B2B. Um, but Cognizant also had a really great example here. Um, where, you know, you've got the guy saying, dude, my pipeline is so big this quarter. And the guy's like, okay, but you haven't closed any of them, right? So anybody that's worked in sales, and of course you're in B2B SaaS, so you're very familiar with, you know, the, the closing cycle of sales, they immediately get the joke. So you're immediately connecting with someone that's like, okay, these people get it. They know what we do every day. And you're going to attract your ICP because that's the pain they have every day. So anytime you can find one of those things that I, I joke that you can bond over, um, that always works very well. So... To wrap up, um, please remember paid media success does not equal immediate gratification. You have to go into it realizing this is driving your future growth from a healthy audience that you are cultivating. 
Um, it's, it's amazing that I still see as often as I do that people spend money and they just want paid media to do all the heavy lifting for them. But if you neglect any of those other areas I showed, you're just throwing money into the void because just because you're paying for media, that does not establish the credibility that you're going to need to convert people over to your world. Judge quality signals in your paid media efforts. And by quality signals, it is not how many people subscribed right away. It is not how many demos were booked right away. It's what's the likelihood you are getting the attention of the right users. You have a bunch of data I just showed you that will tell you all of that very accurately. That's what you should be judging, especially with top of funnel. Invest in value and content and deliver relentlessly. You can do a lot with a small team. Um, in my previous role, it was me and one content marketer, and it was amazing how much we got done. You need to repurpose, you need to be loud, um, and you need to be comfortable investing in amplification using the metrics that I showed you to guide you into what work, what's working and what is not. So don't slack on that. Invest in human-facing value and content. Deliver relentlessly human-facing. Human facing, not business. Yes, you're talking to other businesses, but you're talking to humans at those businesses. So that was everything I have for today. And I am totally excited to chat and answer questions. Boom, boom, boom. All right. Thank you very much. Exciting stuff. Uh, sure. You said invest in value and content. So you mean do things that are not PPC? Yes, but use paid media to amplify them. So for example, let's say you come up with like an amazing guidebook, right? It's like, it needs to exist on your site, but those are also the types of things that I would say, put money behind and see how many people are interested in it. And, and so, so basically a good old lead magnet stuff. Yes. Yeah. And the thing is, I think people put a lot of pressure on lead magnets. Um, and, you know, we find more and more people don't want gated content. So the other thing that I encourage places to do is it's like, if you want to test it online and be like, hey, drop us your email, and we'll just send it to you directly. The other thing is you can test people just coming to the site. And we actually found a lot of times by making it not gated, just being like, hey, here's our thing if you want it. So many people would come to the site and they would grab the PDF and they would sign up for the newsletter anyway, because they're like, wow, this thing is amazing. So it's like we weren't gating it we were just providing value and people just signed up because they're like wow if they give this for free then i want it delivered to me um so if you built some goodwill it'll actually go a long way uh okay uh what do you think about like uh, on linkedin for instance brands can boost post not individuals yes. yet but brands can uh any thoughts yes many thoughts um i have tested a bazillion times running especially content amplification as traffic ads versus promoting an existing organic post, your costs and your click-through rate will be a bazillion times better if you just promote an existing post. Um, the website traffic ads are expensive. I don't find their click-through rate is good. Um, mm -hmm. So if there's something that you think you wanna promote from like a content perspective, do a really, really good organic LinkedIn post about it first and then go over and promote it as an engagement post. Your results will be way, 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 way better. Uh, what do you think about uh, these B2B uh, targeting plan, like clear bit advertising, you know, like B2B targeting on Facebook? Ever, ever use that? Yes. Um, so I've used a few of them um, with varying results. Uh, I have, I've had some lookalikes based off them work really well. Um, I'm trying to remember who I used last time. It wasn't clear bit. It was one, of, it was one of their competitors. Um, but I was actually impressed with how well it did. Um, you know, the key obviously is always going to be, is it a big enough market that if you try and create a lookalike off of it, can it figure out who it is? Right. So you don't really know, uh, necessarily how large and or accurate their data is. Um, so, far, but like I said, so far, my experience has been good. Um, on the on the Facebook side, um, it definitely carries cost with it. So, um, you know, A, you're paying for the service. And then B, if you create a lookalike off them, the CPMs do tend to be higher. So they work, but it's kind of like with LinkedIn. It's like, it's going to be relatively more expensive. So just make sure that what you get out of it aligns with that. You know, it's like if you pay 
a $30 CPM to reach these people and their opt-ins are really low, it's not really going to do a whole lot of good. So um, it's worth testing. It's just make sure that the metrics keep up with the increase in cost. I also see on, uh, you know, demand gen people uh, on LinkedIn chatting with each other. And basically there's some sentiment that if you don't use tools like metadata, you're just burning money. Um, any thoughts? Any I have not found that to be the case. Um, I, on specifically on Facebook, I've had a lot of luck um, targeting uh, like software platforms and, um, publications, that kind of stuff that, that show interest. Um, so I, I think that there's that perception I've, you know, I've found that you can work around that and sometimes the costs are actually better, but it does take more time. Like, I think a lot of people really want a plug and play solution and those platforms kind of act like that's what's going to happen. Um, and like I said, some do, some don't. So it just kind of depends on whether you want to pay the money and how much better it actually does. Um, well, let's take some audience questions. We have quite a bit over here. Uh, let's yeah. start looking at them one by one. So uh, in no particular order, um, if we are primarily focused on targeting our ICP, should mm -hmm. we avoid Google Ads? Google Ads usually is not where I go first, um, which pains me to say. I mean, I've done Google Ads since 2007. So like it's, it's my my comfort zone. It's my happy place. <laughs> um, but the, the biggest problem that you do find is that you cannot filter very well by persona. They have audiences like you could test um, that are B2B ish. But among people that have spent, you know, millions on Google ads with B2B, we all commiserate about how difficult it is. Um, it is very hard. It's expensive. Um, and again, because searchers can sometimes be a little vague in either what they're looking for or who they are, uh, you have the potential for a, a decent amount of waste there. Um, you know, I go back to my example of like, if you're an SEO platform and, you know, you, you're you up against like places that cater to solopreneurs for 50 bucks a month and yours is $5,000 a month, they don't search differently, right? They might search for the same stuff. Um, so you're going to wind up paying, and the, but there's a lot more of the $50 users than there are the 5,000 ones. So you just kind of have to remember it's like a David and Goliath situation where it's like Goliath is going to be the majority of the people out there. So if you're, you know, servicing the Davids of that population, you might have a harder time. Um, it's usually not where I go first. Um, a, a lot of times what I'll say is what can be useful is if you kind of nail, you know, Facebook ads or, or uh, LinkedIn and you're getting the right people to your site, set up your site visitors as an audience, and then just do a bunch of broad match against those people and see what they're searching for. Um, you won't spend a lot of money. You know that they're the people that you want. And you'll kind of figure out like, are there things they're searching for um, that either might have volume we should bid on and or sometimes you'll see they're searching for stuff that would make great content you should be offering top of funnel to. So you say Google Ads is not where you go first. Where do you go first? Uh, usually I go to LinkedIn first these days. Um, the goal being, let me just see what we can get on there and get those people off there as quickly as possible. <laughs> so, um, you know, typically if you have a very focused ICP, there's no other platform where you're going to be able to be so specific about who you want. Um, so a lot of times I tend to go there first and say, start there because you're going to get the quickest feedback loop as far as like, am I offering something people want? Am I reaching the right people? Um, and you know that if they're coming to your site, you're not polluting your site with a bunch of remarketing audiences that you don't want. Uh, okay, next question here. Uh, are gated content campaigns dead? Pretty much. <laughs> um, I have not. The thing that I find with gated content at this point is either people are like, screw you, I don't want to give you my email. Or they'll give the email, they'll get the thing, and then they immediately unsubscribe. So it's not, I don't find that the longevity and health of the opt-ins are really that great if they opt in at all. Um, and the other problem that you run into now is a lot of B2B companies have figured that out. So they don't even do gating. So that now if you are gating content, it better be amazing because you're up against all a whole bunch of other companies that are just going to give it away for free. Um, so the only times that I say that, you know, gating might work is like, if it's like a 50 page guide, if it's something super beefy and like you can prove the value of this is just ridiculous, um, then sometimes gated will still work if it seems like there is a reason that you need their email to be able to deliver it. Um, but other than that, I usually recommend, unless it's a situation like that, 
gated content is very hard to make work anymore. Mm -hmm. I know no one uh, wants to hear that. Sorry. <laughs> I just, I just deliver the truth. It's, I mean, also as, a, as, a, as a human being, I mean, somebody asking for my email and maybe phone number means like BDR is going to call in me. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't that's the thing. I mean, they're, that? they're wise to it. They're like, I'm saying, I just want this thing. And now I know I'm going to get 50 emails from you. You know, it's like, they just are like so gun shy at this point. And they're, I mean, I have to unsubscribe a million times mm -hmm. a week. Um, on my email because I just, it's so easy to sign up for stuff, forget. And then you realize you're getting like 50 emails a day, right? So unless you're, you know, giving them consistent value, that's part of the reason why I always say, look at your email health metrics, because if people sign up and leave, something is not right. Either you're not consistently delivering, you're not delivering the right stuff, like stop paying to get people on that list if that's not working. Mm -hmm. Uh, John is asking about the slide deck. Yes, we'll we'll email it out. Uh, Natalie asks, um, can you elaborate on the human facing value and content? Yeah. So um, the way that I think about this is like, try and look at what your, you know, the solutions you're providing. And instead of being like, our product does this, this, and this, people don't care about your product. I know, I wish they did. I, I mean, our, our jobs would all be easier if they gave a crap about our product, right? They care about themselves and what it solves. So, um, and I think that this has been a real challenge, especially with so much product marketing is that like everything is so product focused that everyone forgets that it's humans using it that are using it for very specific and selfish reasons. Um, so when you're thinking about how you create things like content, Instead of being like, like case studies are a great example, right? Look at what our product helped, helped this business do. They don't care what your product did. They care if someone of that business's job got easier, especially if they are a competitor or in the same vertical, now you have their attention, right? So it's kind of like, you got to peel back those layers a bit. It's, it, it just feels easy and lazy to kind of rely on talking about the product, be like, oh, our connectivity and this and that. But it's like, humans don't care about that stuff. So one of the, the things that is really helpful to do um, is, and I actually was uh, recently did a podcast episode about this um, with uh, my co-host was, where do you get your input for marketing, right? And so usually product marketers are not the best place to get, you know, like consumer facing stuff. The good places to go are talk to current customers and be like, why, did, why do you use this? Why is this helpful? Um, salespeople, your sales team, if they're good salespeople, they will have immense immense amounts of insights as to how, how do people react when they see the demo? What is the thing that they get hung up on the most? What is the problem that they say this is solving? Like what blows their minds? Those are the nuggets because that's the feedback coming from humans. It's not coming from a product sheet. It's not coming from a spec sheet. These are people that have either decided to have a demo or decided to pay for it. So why? They're not going to come back and be like, oh, because the systems administrator does blah, blah, blah. That's not what they're going to say. They're going to be like, oh, my God, this saved me like three hours because I hate doing that. Right. They're going to be very honest about how it changed their day to day. And that's the stuff that people care about in the top of funnel. I hope that helps. I don't know if it was yeah. Really um, <laughs> number of questions also added to the chat. So let me see if I can dig some up here. Um, automated CPC versus manual on LinkedIn. Yes. Um, I would say for CPC based stuff, uh, if you're doing web traffic, definitely cap it. Um, and they, in LinkedIn will always be like, oh, you should be spending $10. No, you don't have to. Um, also opt out of their partner network thing. I forget what they call it these days. Cause I just unchecked the box. It's crap. Do not just be on LinkedIn, uncheck all the other crap. Um, I think when it comes to things like lead gen forms or, um, you know, things that have like a definite on platform action, I would not cap those initially. And I feel the same way about Facebook because you need to see what it's going to cost first. I see a lot of places try and control that cost by launching a campaign and saying, okay, I want a $50 CPA, but if the campaign has no data yet, and if you set that too low, it's never going to get enough data to optimize. So I would say, let it run the way it's going to run at first, let it optimize itself, see how low it gets, and then make decisions about, you know, is this doable for us? Like, is it at a cost that we could keep doing? Um, but it's, it's hard to kind of control the algorithm that way because then it never learns, you know, unless, unless you run it for a long time and then you're like, okay, I feel confident, you know, this will just 
we're good. We're close to a hundred dollars CPA, whatever we want. Let's just cap it at that. And you change it. Um, that can work. Okay. Uh, cause it has some data to work off of, but when it's new, it's, it's very hard to cost cap and have it work. Yeah. Uh, another question here. If you leverage a data enrichment or ABM tool mm -hmm. that should help with lead quality, it just cost more upfront. I guess it's a comment, not a question. Yeah. Do you agree with this comment? Uh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was kind of like I was saying with, um, you know, like metadata or any of those things, it, it does cost more. So you just need to make sure it, you know, it, the lead quality is better, but how much cost is it adding? Right. Like if it's adding enough cost mm. that it's like, it doesn't really help us. Like it's winding up being more expensive than, you know, if, if I run something on Facebook, for example, and let's say I get like $5 opt-ins and 25% of them are my ICP, is that math better than getting, you know, 10 opt-ins, but we're paying for the ABM tool. We're paying extra because the CPM is now higher because we're running lookalikes. Like you need to weigh all the math. Um, a lot of people get very focused on like, well, this, you know, this percent of the leads was, was our ICP. And it's like, yeah, but again, how much is that costing you? You know, it's like, if you're able to reach this mm -hmm. huge scale on Facebook and pay very little for each opt-in, and then you do the math of like, what is it for an actual ICP? Does that work out yeah. in your favor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you go into, uh, you know, you audit a bunch of PPC accounts. Uh, you did that recently for winter. So when you go in, what are, what are like the, the repeatable things that you find? What, what tends to be the- Horrible subject lines. <laughs> for, um, for, for ads? Uh, no, I, for specific to email marketing, um, one of the things that I see happen a lot oh. is they'll, they'll spend on paid to acquire people. And then the welcome series just doesn't have, it's not a compelling welcome. And so you'll see opt-outs happen a lot. Um, so people might say, yes, I want to be opted into your newsletter. And then the first email they get doesn't sound anything like the ad they saw. It seems like it was written by someone different. It doesn't feel like a human sending it. Um, so if you're doing all those things right, you know, the ad makes it feels like the business is, you know, humans that are solving problems. And then that first experience, if they opted in and they get emails, um, does it still sound like the same person? Um, so I think that's, it's, it's not directly what happens on the paid side, but that's where I see a lot of, um, waste happen. I think as far as, you know, the ads themselves that go for email opt-ins, you ha a lot of places just aren't very specific. They're just like, sign up for a newsletter. Okay, what is that? Is it weekly? What do you cover? Like, do, is it webinars? Is it blog posts? Is it exclusive to people on the email list? Like, they're just not very specific and they wonder why people don't sign up. But it's like, I'm not, I don't yeah. wanna commit to an email unless I know exactly what the hell I'm getting <laughs> because I don't, I don't wanna sign up and get emails every day, right? So be super specific about what they can expect and be very specific about who the content is for. Like, don't be afraid of turning off people. Um, I think that's the other thing that happens is they're very general about what the, the people get. And then they feel like they have to appeal to everybody. So they can be like, oh, look, we got 5,000 email opt-ins. I don't want that. I want a hundred of the perfect person. So mm. use the email, like lead gen form ads, use it as an opportunity to exclude people. You know what I mean? Like you, you only want the right people. A, for your own database, but B, that's also going to help you refine your media buy over time to understand, you know, who is coming in that's actually the people we want based on these different targets, right? Um, I see that a lot, though, where it's like just very general promises. Uh, it's like, is this for example, like, is this for anybody that works in e -com? Is it for people that work in fashion apparel of a certain size? Like, be very specific about who you want. I see a lot of companies are very afraid of that. Um, but you're, you're going to save yourself a lot of time and money if you're specific. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I hear, like, when I speak to marketing leaders, uh, they tell me that what I want to do is I want to increase the amount of best fit customers in my pipeline, mm -hmm. meaning they want customers who are willing to pay the highest ACV, Mm -hmm. and who retain the better. Uh, so I don't want just more pipeline. I want more, better pipeline. Yep. Um, so if we're truly focused in on a, like a specific type of ICP, um, um, any, any additional tips? 
I think that's where that figuring out what is that qualification question and having it on every single form plays a humongous part. And it's not just on the immediate paid side. Um, the other thing that I look at is, you know, once you implement that on your site, and if you start doing a lot of brand awareness and external content promotion and that kind of stuff, look at who's submitting on your site from direct and organic traffic. That is going to tell you a mm. lot about are the other things I'm doing that are immediately unmeasurable, are we ultimately still driving the right user, right? So if you're going out and you're doing all this stuff and you have thousands of people coming to your site, they're filling out an opt-in form and none of them are your ICP, something you're putting out there is not working, right? So that's mm -hmm. the other thing I tell people to look at is it's like, you can't directly control, you know, your brand search or your, you know, your direct traffic, but there's still data there too. It's like, who are these people that are submitting? And if it's misaligned, either, you know, you're not putting the right stuff out there, your site is not communicating exactly mm -hmm. who you were the best fit for. There's usually some other marketing piece that's not working quite right. Um, that it's not as evident as something like paid because like mm -hmm. I said, with those, you can pretty quickly like download your lead form segment by who's ICP and who's not and understand where you stand. Um, but there's a lot that you can learn about people that start coming to your site. And especially as you start doing more of this stuff, you will see as you run paid media, you're going to get more direct traffic. You're going to get more brand search. It's just a natural halo effect of brand awareness. Um, and so that's kind of another way to understand, like, is what I'm putting out there reaching the right people? Because if it's not, stop paying it. <laughs> Don't pay to keep mm -hmm. amplifying this stuff. And then also figure out what is misaligned with your content or your site or your messaging. Let's see. Do we have any further new questions here? Uh, John is asking, uh -huh. is average time on site and CPC enough to measure whether a specific piece of content does well on mid funnel campaigns? It's mm -hmm. a good question. So I always call this the messy middle. It, the mid funnel is always the hardest part because a lot of times, like if they're already opted in and they continue to come back, a lot of times people are like, how do I know that? Like, how do I know which piece of content was working? They're already on the list. A lot of times there's not a clear cut answer to that. It's, um, you know, the average time on site and CPC, that's usually how I just understand, are we generating interest? Um, a lot of times if they, if they, we have a CPC that we can live with, they're coming to the site and they're spending time. That's when I'll look at, did they opt in while they were on the site? It's not going to be necessarily tied back to that campaign in it, in the platform itself. Um, but understanding, uh, you know, are we driving it at a cost we can stomach is the um the uh engagement piece good but the other thing that we started to find too is our salespeople will ask like you know how did you hear about us or what what made you decide to book the demo and um surprisingly a lot of times you know people be like oh i saw your webinar on x or oh i got the guidebook and it was amazing so sometimes you'll actually get anecdotal feedback that will help you understand the impact on bottom of funnel because there are some things you just can't measure and it's like the mid funnel is always the hardest part it's always the the one that places are like but i want to be able to measure something but it's just hard to do because normally it's going to be like 10 things that happened over the span of three months is what got them from mid funnel to bottom funnel it's not always one thing um, you know, they, they, like one client I worked with, we found that it on average, they'd sign up for the email. They would not request the demo until four months later. So it's like, mm -hmm. was the email opt in the reason? Well, it was one of them, but they had consistently opened them. They had read them. They told us that they followed us on social. So it's like, there's a lot of things you're not going to be mm -hmm. able to specifically measure. Um, you just kind of have to know that all those pieces are doing something in the middle and it, it you know, if you look at attribution paths, they're all over the place. It's like, there's, there's never going to be one in that mid funnel that you're like, this is what we always have to do. Um, yeah. it's just, you know, firing out a bunch of messages and eventually they connect the right way for people. Awesome. Susan, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and experience. With Happy us. To. <laughs> uh, everybody connect with Susan on LinkedIn, Twitter. She's uh, sharing good shit there. She has a great podcast. Give it a follow. Susan, thank you again. I'll, I'll see you later. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week.